Good morning. Good morning. want to welcome everyone to our service this morning. It's a beautiful day out, nice and warm. Boy, last week was a nice week, too. I mean, you're up in the 80s. It was almost getting too hot. But this week, it's going to be in the 70s. Now, I think this morning, Wednesday, is going to be in the lows are going to be in the 30s. So, but hey, it's a great day. Yeah. We're alive. We're here to worship our Lord. What more can, what better can happen? Announcements for uh, this morning, opportunities for the week. Um, the ALC and the Finance Committee will hold their bi-monthly meeting this afternoon at 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, some of us have things going on tomorrow, so we, tomorrow night normally would be um, the evening in which we get together, but because of things going on, we're going to hold it this afternoon. We don't have choir practice today, so we're going to have um, we're going to have the meeting at four o'clock this afternoon. Um, Bible study. I do not know about Bible study on Wednesday. I, I'll have to find out from Beverly if she wants if she's going to be able to do it or not, or or whether she'll have. Pardon me, John. Okay, all right. John says, and he's the he's the Sunday school and the education chairman. We aren't going to be here. There's no Bible study on uh, Wednesday evening at 6:30. The food pantry will be at uh, 10 till 2 on Thursday. Uh, any opportunities that I may have missed. You may have seen that Jake's not here. Well, we'll put him on our prayer list, but Jake, and Tommy, and Jake, Tommy has positive for COVID. That, huh? As far as I know, he's okay, but being Jake lives with Tommy, he's he's got to be, he's under quarantine too, so that's why he's not here this morning. I know he's missed, and everybody likes his smiling face and just being around. But um, I'm going to put it, we'll put him on him and his dad on prayer list. So, um, any other announcements? Mike, would you say uh, opening prayer, please? Praise you, Lord, our gracious heavenly Father. We thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's uh, all stand and sing When We All Get to Heaven, number 701.
continue stand and let's uh, sing uh, the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then you shall judge, judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection body, and life everlasting. Amen. Cooper, Helen Durden, Brenda Howe, Barbara Knight, Merlene Gay Lackey, Jim Moore, West Moy, Tommy and Deborah Shepard, Mary Helen Tapley, Billy Thomas, Lynn Thomas, Burnett Watson, Johnny Webb, Willie May Webb, Nancy Willis, Kelly Wilson, and Jean Yates. Someone took my bulletin. Debbie Kofer. Debbie Any other names we need to add to the long term prayer list? Pardon me? <laughs> Short term is Rev Bev and Reverend Don King, Joyce Linsman, Becky Crosby, Arlene Yates, Bridget Zurich. How's Bridget doing? Okay. Well, keep tell Bridget we're keeping her prayers. Kyler Phillips, Camille Bermia, Ryan Wicker, and then Tommy and Jake. Anyone else that we need to add to the short? Jackie? Probably need to put, add her to the prayer list, the long term, don't you think? Becky Crosby. Anyone else to the short term? Family love? Is Charlie Logston. Anyone else we need to the add to the David family? Jones. David Jones. Anyone else?
decision that this denomination will make in future weeks, months, and years. We come to you now in prayer, praying the prayer you should talk to your disciples, pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, the power, the power, and the glory of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. Only trust him. I know uh, years ago he said he was uh, with our youth here from uh, what Pine Hill, I think you said, right? So uh, we just want to—I just want to welcome you. And this church wants to welcome you, welcome you to our church, and and looking forward to having you bring the message this morning. Thank, Thank you, so Mike. Said I had to hold this button down. You got to hear me on Facebook now. I'm all I'm all, I'm I'm all about Facebook. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, it is good to be back at Gethsemane. I. Uh, did used to come here uh, years and years ago. I guess it was back in the 70s when uh, we had a, a 
active, vital United Methodist Youth Program, MYF, I think we called it back then at the Methodist Church. And uh, every month or every quarter, we would visit different churches in the Dublin District, what used to be the old Dublin District. And uh, we would come to Gethsemane and other churches in the area. I remember coming here and going out to Buckhorn over in uh, Dexter and uh, different places. And uh, praise be to God for uh, Sarah Jo White and the people who uh, taught me the right way to do, even though I didn't always follow it. And uh, but life's a circle, and uh, you know if the Lord tells us if we raise up in a child in the way which they are to go, then we'll return. <laughs> we'll come back home. Before I get started, is Ryan Wicker, is that Ken, is that any of Billy Wicker's? That's his daughter-in-law? Okay. Billy Wicker and uh, Ralph Haywood were great mentors in my life. My scripture today comes from uh, Paul's epistles to the Philippians. This was written around 60 A.D. And this letter is one of Paul's prison epistles, which he wrote when he was in prison in Rome. Paul visited Philippi on his second missionary journey, and it was there that Lydia and the Philippian jailer and his family were converted to Christ. By now, some few years later, the church at Philippi was well established at the time of this writing. And it may be inferred that it was well established by Paul's language referring to the bishops and the elders and the deacons in the church. Please join with me now as we read part of this letter in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may bear your affairs, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Dear Lord, we thank you for Paul, for his writings, for the writings of the other apostles. We thank you for the foresight that he had in writing to this church at Philippi. We thank you for the foresight that he and the other apostles had to write these letters down, to write these stories down, that they might be relevant in some future time. We pray that we can see the relevance written over 2,000 years ago almost in our lives today. That Paul's words would not go unheeded and that your church would follow his guidance. In Christ's holy name, When is the last time you wrote a letter? I don't mean a greeting card. 
but a letter or at least a short note to someone. When my son Michael was born, I began writing him letters, not because he was a little genius, but because I wanted him to know what went on in his lifetime. And so he would have them when he got older. I spent a career working for the state of Georgia and another career, part-time career in the Georgia Army National Guard. I was away from home a lot. In the 1970s, I worked here in East Dublin. I started a career in law enforcement by happenstance and came to work at the East Dublin Police Department as a radio operator in 1976. And after that, went to work for the state, and being at home was a luxury when you work undercover narcotics and you're working all over the state of Georgia. The letters were like letters I remembered from my childhood that I remember my parents getting or my grandparents getting. I would write about where I might be at the time, what I was doing, and I assured Michael, even though he could not read, that I loved him so dearly and could not wait to get home. The letters were never mailed. I put them in a folder along with saving bond, savings bonds that I had purchased at his young age with his birth certificate to be given to him at a much later date. A few months ago, he was visiting me in Richmond Hill and I had come across that folder and I gave it to him. He was more interested in the savings bonds and how much they were worth <laughs> than he was anything I had written. Recently, my mother gave me my grandfather Brantley's Bible. As I was looking through it, I found notes that he had placed there when he was a lay leader at Pine Hill United Methodist Church on the other side of the river there, and other documents one of which was a letter. And I'll share it with you today. April the 17th, 1961. Willacoochee, Georgia. Dear Brother Taylor, I am sending this picture and you know it is about time for rabbits to go to eating up the beans might help more ways than one. Boy, am I looking forward with great pleasure to being with you. Tell those people to start praying now that we might have a great meeting. Brother, I, Brother Taylor, I cannot be there until for the night service. I promised two Mondays ago, Snow Church on the Pinehurst Charge to preach their homecoming sermon on that day, and I just cannot get off the hook. I should be over there by 4 o'clock p.m. Thanks again for asking me. Love, CB Still. Hope you, are, hope you all are fine. We are. If you've been in the Methodist community for any length of time, for that many years, I never knew Reverend Stud Still, but I heard my grandparents talk about him, and he had served uh, charges here in this district. My mother did not recall what the letter was about. If Reverend Stud Still was coming to preach a homecoming at Pine Hill, or exactly what the occasion was. But in that old Bible, there was proof 
tangible proof that two Christian brothers were corresponding with each other. I've read the letter at least three, three times now, and today, this morning, makes four. My wife says that I waste too much time watching old movies or reading books that I've had for years and going through stuff which she calls junk I have accumulated throughout two careers. She may be right. But each time I watch an old movie or listen to an old song, I always seem to discover a line or a scene that I never saw before. If you go grocery shopping and you go down one aisle looking for something and you come back on the same aisle, you may find it or see some things you didn't see before, or at least I do when my wife sends me grocery shopping. My Bible is like that. Every time I study or read a scripture, I see or learn something that I had not noticed before. These are some of the things which have brought me to where I live today. Not in a physical location, but where I live in the Holy Spirit today. Several Sundays ago, my stepfather and I, some of you may know Ed Kersey, uh, we were eating dinner at, after church as he likes to do at the Cloverleaf restaurant here in East Dublin. And Don and Beverly were there, and we joined them for our meal. And Don asked me to say grace before we ate our food. Afterwards, when we got through eating, he pulled me aside and he said, I've been thinking of asking you to speak at Pine Hill, but he wanted to hear me pray first. <laughs> I've been a lay leader and lay speaker for uh, several years now. And that statement had no significance at the time until yesterday when I was reflecting on how I came to be here today and speak at Pine Hill last Sunday. What a high and remarkable test for a lay person in our church. That coupled with one of my daily devotions last week and an openness to our Holy Spirit led me to the scripture today. I've always been a student of Paul. I'm continuing to read a book that's about this thick about Paul's life and about all the different places that he visited and, and did missionary work. And I would like to go to Jerusalem, but there's another tour I would really love to go on, and that is one that walks in the footsteps of Paul. I appreciate his character. I appreciate his loyalty as the person of Saul prosecuting Christians and the zest with which he did everything in his life. I appreciate the way our Lord dealt with him on the Damascus Road. And his undying devotion to our Christ and to the church which Christ ordained. There have been many times in my life when I wish somebody would have taken me into a cornfield and whipped my behind instead of trying to talk some sense into me. It would have done probably more good. I can understand the way God dealt with Paul or with Saul. 
What do we hear when we hear Paul say, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? I was eavesdropping on the Sunday school class in here this morning as I was reading over my notes again. And I said, I really don't think I probably need to even speak. The Sunday school class that was being held in here talked about letters written by people in the Bible and the impact those letters can still have on our lives today. When I read that, I hear Paul say, behave and be patient. He goes on to write, I'm sorry, I'll uh, come back to Jay in a minute. <clears throat> We've grown up in a world where the church is seen in our culture and the surrounding world to one who believes. A recent survey, if one can believe our media outlets today, indicates that church membership Church affiliation, or those who attend church at some time during a year, is now less than 50% of our population here in the United States. That's down from 64% less than 10 years ago. The world in our country understands the church is primarily a don't society do not do this or do not do that, who lives according to a moral code. Since I retired from my full-time employment, I had the opportunity to teach uh, college courses, and I teach them at Savannah Technical College as an adjunct instructor. And I teach criminal justice courses about four or five courses a year, depending on the enrollment. About two times a year, I'm assigned to teach professional ethics in criminal justice, being ethical when no one is looking. Each new semester, I also find or learn something new that I had not grasped before. I find something new in the textbook that we use or in the material we present. As we prepare for the final days of this semester, our studies are on the future. Will we be more or less ethical? The author of the book, J. Albanese, opines in his writing that the daily course of unhappy human events can sometimes make us cynical about the prospects for ethical behavior. Is there any hope in the future for more ethical conduct, more of the time, and by more people? He goes on to write, can you go for 24 hours without saying anything unkind to anyone or about anyone? This would seem to be a simple task. But it is amazing how many people have trouble accomplishing it. People routinely curse out other drivers or make disparaging comments about coworkers, bosses, friends, or even family members. Just as a person who cannot go for a day without drinking or smoking, a person who cannot go a day without speaking ill of others has a character problem. The 24-hour test, like prayer, is a good way to begin a baseline ethical test for ourselves. I've had the privilege of knowing two people like that, at least. One was my grandmother. Grace and the lifelong mentor and colleague of mine, Charles Sykes. Grace would uh, not say anything bad about anyone. 
she may have been the person that coined the phrase we hear today, bless your heart, but she didn't necessarily say anything negative. She more often spoke of, well, you don't know what that person or this person's going through. Or maybe they're just having a bad day. Charles was my supervisor for many years in the GBI and has remained a close friend that I talk to almost weekly. In 45 years, I have never heard him say any negative thing about any person. Now, that's remarkable in law enforcement. That's remarkable anywhere, but it was especially remarkable in the line of work that we did. My grandmother used to say, silence is golden. We don't have to say anything sometimes. Students of criminal justice are sometimes perplexed to learn that our society our laws and our culture are based on Judeo-Christian ethics. As a church, we have somehow come to expect the world to live by those same moral codes. And when the world does not, sometimes we in the church act surprised and judge them accordingly. And J.D. Walt, who I subscribe to as part of my daily devotions, in a recent devotion right anymore. And all of this is happening on our watch as Christians. Walt always catches my attention when he references an old country music singer, as my pastor in Richmond Hill, Jay Tucker, does. Jay says that country music singers are modern day prophets. He's preached that in his first sermon when he first came to Richmond Hill and I was a devoted follower from then on. But Walt wrote in this devotion this week that it could be like the old Merle Haggard song Are we rolling downhill like a snowball headed for hell? I used to play that when I worked as a DJ over at WXLI here in Dublin many, many years ago. So, our woods are filled with bears and our ponds are full of alligators. Do you want to go for a walk or take a swim? So what are we to do? Are we to get mad at the world, protest, retreat and hide? Are we to spend more of our valuable resources studying things to see what the problem is? I submit we have the answer to most of our problems in our Bibles and in our hearts. In Iraq, I had the privilege of working for General David M. Rodriguez. At that time, General Rodriguez commanded the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment where we were and when, when we were in Nineveh province. If you've read about the walls of Nineveh in the Old Testament, that's where we were. I rode by them about once a week, but I couldn't get out and look around because I was scared we'd get blowed up. During a briefing one day when we were trying to get the Mosul electrical grid working, the briefer made the mistake of telling General Rodriguez that we had assessed the situation and needed yet another assessment on the grid. General Rodriguez stopped the briefing and said something to the effect with some nice language in it. We have assessed this country to death. It's about time we did something. Since 1992, I've been a news junkie. I listen and I read all sides of issues in our country, and I try desperately to find any American news that will inform us 
what's going on in other parts of the world other than what somebody has tweeted, texted, or sent an email about. I long for Walter Cronkite and only 30 minutes of national news a day. I am amazed at how little students know in the classes I teach about our Constitution, our Founding Fathers, our current events. I'm amazed, too, at their inability to critically think about the information they do have. Sometimes it seems that if it's not on the iPhones we carry, we simply don't know about a topic. And there's a growing number in our population of all ages who seek immediate gratification, immediate response, and measure their worth by how many likes they have on Facebook or some other social media. And our suicide rates among youth are climbing every day. Our technology has become a double-edged sword. If we spend too much time in front of the 24-hour news cycle or on social media, we can easily become discouraged. And as Christians, we must pause to put things into context and realize that God's time is not our time. I can imagine the time Paul spent writing the church at Philippi. The thoughtful choice of words. If you read the beginning of that chapter in the whole book of Philippians, the enormous amount of time he spent on salutations and greeting those who had brought him money while he was in prison. And the reflection gained from writing a purposeful communication before he hit the send button. My wife is a social media guru. She loves it. And I've cautioned her before, before you respond, set that thing aside and think about before you. And a lot of times she'll come back and delete whatever she's written. You know, the great thing about writing, and when we used to teach writing in schools, when you write something, you think about what you're writing. It gives us time to pause. As a student at the U.S. Army War College, we were taught to always set aside what we had written for a project and come back and look at it the next day. As a law enforcement officer and a military officer, I have spent a lifetime trying to fix things, planning for criminal procedures, military campaigns, and the like. But after half a century of living and coming closer to my God, I learned that I cannot fix anything. We cannot fix family members, we cannot fix friends. We cannot fix our society. Christ says, let me worry about that. Paul has an interesting way of communicating. In chapter 4 of Philippians, he writes in his closing lines to the church at Philippi and to us that he has learned in whatever state he is in in this to be content. I don't think Paul was talking about a particular country, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, or Georgia. Whatever state in life we are in, therewith to be content. He tells us that whatever happens in our scripture today, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of 
Christ. I used to say Fordham, that's hard to do. How do we be worthy of the gospel of Christ? Pentecost is coming up in our Christian calendar. And the simple thing that Christ has asked us to do is to go. One simple two-letter word, to go. And tell his story. Tell his story about how it's affected our lives. We cannot fix anything and the simple thing that Christ has asked us to do in order to change things is to live, live our lives so that we become a new creation, a profoundly humble, pure-hearted, radically embracing person of extraordinary holy love. It is not so much about what we do not do, but who we are becoming together as a church and as followers of Christ. It is about becoming a community of people whose relationships are telling a different story, who are writing an alternative ending to an otherwise broken storyline from what we may see in the media or on social media. Between church, your church and Sunday school services today, I learned that many here have gone to Mexico on mission trips. And I relayed a mission. So thinking about that, what if we think of ourselves, Christians, as people of another country? Sometimes it seems like I'm living in another country. A strange land that we did not grow up in. How do we want to conduct ourselves? Will we take time to leave tangible records of our faith for those who may find or come across a letter years after we are gone? Paul encourages us to stand firm in the one spirit, God, ahead of the American dream whatever that once was or would now become. Are we ready to claim our citizenship? I think I'll go home this afternoon and write a couple of letters. I'll do a closing prayer. Let me get through. End it. What's our answer going to be? That's up to you. Link, Nora, would you want to come up here, please? Every third Sunday, we. Shelby Cox is a missionary. altar is all, always open and if, if any one of you need to come up and something going on in your life Mike and myself will always be here I am sing
verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. <laughs>